This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa, Michael.Sirwah, S I R O I S dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Eight Future Times. Book Eight, Section Two. In the southwestern district of the city, on an eminence which had preserved its ancient name of Fort St. Michel, there stretched a square where some old trees still spread their exhausted arms above the greensward. Landscape gardeners had constructed a cascade, grottoes, a torrent, a lake, and an island on its northern slope. From this side one could see the whole town with its streets, its boulevards, its squares, the multitude of its roofs and domes, its air passages, and its crowds of men, covered with a veil of silence, and seemingly enchanted by the distance. This square was the healthiest place in the capital. Here no smoke obscured the sky, and children were brought here to play. In summer, some employees from the neighboring offices and laboratories used to resort to it for a moment after their luncheons, but they did not disturb its solitude and peace. It was owing to this custom that one day in June, about midday, a telegraph clerk, Caroline Meslier, came and sat down on a bench at the end of a terrace. In order to refresh her eyes by the sight of a little green, she turned her back to the town. Dark, with brown eyes, robust and placid, Caroline appeared to be from twenty-five to twenty-eight years of age. Almost immediately, a clerk in the electricity trust, Georges Clare, took his place beside her. Fair, thin, and supple, he had features of a feminine delicacy. He was scarcely older than she, and looked still younger. As they met almost every day in this place, a comradeship had sprung up between them, and they enjoyed chatting together, but their conversation had never been tender, affectionate, or even intimate. Caroline, although it happened to her in the past to repent of her confidence, might perhaps have been less reserved, had not George Clare always shown himself extremely restrained in his expressions and behavior. He always gave a purely intellectual character to the conversation, keeping it within the realm of general ideas, and, moreover, expressing himself on all subjects with the greatest freedom. He spoke frequently of the organization of society and the conditions of labor. Wealth, said he, is one of the means of living happily, but people have made it the sole end of existence. And this state of things seemed monstrous to both of them. They returned continually to various scientific subjects with which they were both familiar. On that day they discussed the evolution of chemistry. From the moment, said Clare, that radium was seen to be transformed into helium, people ceased to affirm the immutability of simple bodies. In this way all those old laws about simple relations and about the indestructibility of matter were abolished. However, said she, chemical laws exist. For being a woman, she had need of belief. He resumed carelessly, Now that we can procure radium in sufficient quantities, science possesses incomparable means of analysis. Even at present we get glimpses, within what are called simple bodies, of extremely diversified complex ones, and we discover energies in matter which seem to increase even by reason of its tenuity. As they talked, they threw bits of bread to the birds, and some children played around them. Passing from one subject to another, this hill, in the quaternary epoch, said Clare, was inhabited by wild horses. Last year, as they were tunneling for the water mains, they found a layer of the bones of primeval horses. She was anxious to know whether, at that distant epoch, man had yet appeared. He told her that man used to hunt the primeval horse long before he tried to domesticate him. Man, he added, was at first a hunter. Then he became a shepherd, a, a cultivator, a manufacturer, and these diverse civilizations succeeded each other at intervals of time that the mind cannot conceive. He took out his watch. Caroline asked if it was already time to go back to the office. He said it was not, that it was scarcely half-past twelve. A little girl was making mud pies at the foot of their bench. A little boy of seven or eight years was playing in front of them. Whilst his mother was sewing on an adjoining bench, he played all alone at being a runaway horse, and with that power of illusion, of which children are capable, he imagined that he was at the same time the horse and those who ran after him, and those who fled in terror before him. He kept struggling with himself and shouting, 
Stop him! Hi, hi! This is an awful horse. He's got the bit between his teeth. Caroline asked the question, Do you think that men were happy formerly? Her companion answered, They suffered less when they were younger. They acted like that little boy. They played. They played at arts, at virtues, at vices, at heroism, at beliefs, at pleasures. They had illusions which entertained them. They made a noise. They amused themselves. But now... He interrupted himself and looked again at his watch. The child, who was running, struck his foot against the little girl's pail and fell his full length on the gravel. He remained a moment, stretched out motionless, then raised himself up on the palms of his hands. His forehead puckered, his mouth opened, and he burst into tears. His mother ran up, but Caroline had lifted him from the ground and was wiping his eyes and mouth with her handkerchief. The child kept on sobbing, and Claire took him in his arms. "'Come, don't cry, my little man. I am going to tell you a story. A fisherman once threw his net into the sea, and drew out a little sealed copper pot, which he opened with his knife. Smoke came out of it, and as it mounted up to the clouds the smoke grew thicker and thicker and became a giant, who gave such a terrible yawn that the whole world was blown to dust.' Clare stopped himself, gave a dry laugh, and handed the child back to his mother. Then he took out his watch again, and kneeling on the bench, with his elbows resting on its back, he gazed at the town. As far as the eye could reach, the multitude of houses stood out in their tiny immensity. Caroline turned her eyes in the same direction. "'What splendid weather it is!' said she. "'The sun's rays change the smoke on the horizon into gold.' The worst thing about civilization is that it deprives one of the light of day. He did not answer. His looks remained fixed on a place in the town. After some seconds of silence, they saw, about a half a mile away, in the richer district on the other side of the river, a sort of tragic fog rearing itself upwards. A moment afterwards, an explosion was heard even where they were sitting, and an immense tree of smoke mounted towards the pure sky. Little by little, the air was filled with an imperceptible murmur caused by the shouts of thousands of men. Cries burst forth quite close to the square. What has been, what blown, has been, blown, up? What has been blown up? What has been blown up? The bewilderment was great, for although accidents were common, such a violent explosion as this one had never been seen, and everybody perceived that something terribly strange had happened. Attempts were made to locate the place of the accident, Districts, streets, different buildings, clubs, theatres, and shops were mentioned. Information gradually became more precise, and at last the truth was known. The steel trust has just been blown up. Claire put his watch back into his pocket. Caroline looked at him closely, and her eyes filled with astonishment. At last she whispered in his ear, Did you know it? Were you expecting it? Was it you? you? He answered very calmly, that town ought to be destroyed. She replied in a gentle and thoughtful tone, I think so too. And both of them returned quietly to their work. End of Book 8, Section 2